To me, Los Angeles is just an endless sprawl of suburban subdivisions set out in a massive grid which circles Hollywood, that fraudulent mecca of egotistical schemers. Oh, everybody's got a grift in Hollywood or working hard on devising one. The entire city is paved with broken hearts, shattered dreams, and dashed hopes. Everyone expects their 15 minutes, not realizing that their minor brush with greatness will live to forever torture their polluted lives, creating an almost unbearable mantra which cries out for what could have been, what should have been, and what will never, ever be. It's history of random violence, drive-by shootings, highway snipers, serial killers, religious cults, and countless casualties revolves around the endless possibility that something greater is almost within reach of every leech, loser, and lowlife. Hollywood has created a Sodom with the help of a corporate machine which feeds on the bruised bones of sacrificial offerings. That undeserved fame, untold riches, unimaginable wealth reside side by side a desperate poverty whose scope is forever overlooked, avoided, ignored, is the root of so much sickness which swells within its soured belly. Now, I went out to LA with a dream on my sleeve too. A dream of escaping the asshole who was obsessing my life back in New York City. Just a small vacation, three or four days. Put a call into Pleasant, this hot Hollywood fixture. She was a friend of a friend from New York. She was a luscious redhead who was part belly dancer and all ghost of Jane Mansfield. I knew she knew how to score what from who, whenever. Pleasant suggested I had a party that was happening on my first night in the City of Lights. Suggested I look for Marty, a speedway freak who played hairdresser by day down in Malibu. She claimed he was my type, which I took to mean a little bit twisted. She said he had a thing for Charlie, you know, Manson, and liked to surround himself with chicks that had sexy, sadie fantasies. She was sure I'd be amused. The party was a fucking bust. It was full of jocks and rockabillies and valley chicks, not the kind of people I like to mingle with. So I immediately disappeared into the kitchen looking for something a little bit stronger than liquor. There was a small bowl of quaaludes propped demurely beside a jar of powdered vitamin C. I popped two in my mouth and three in my back pocket for later. I mean, after all, I was going to be out there a few days, and you never know. Someone cranked up the stereo in the living room, and I could hear the strains of early... Carl Perkins rattled the poster board walls. I saw a wide circle form as a greasy biker took center stage and slipped his hair back, threw one hip forward, and began a hilariously awful Elvis impersonation. I knew it must be Marty. I was vaguely repulsed. I disappeared into the master bedroom and bath in search of a small token to justify my journey. On the dresser sat a large tray of costume jewelry. Bypass that shit and open the top drawer. Lots of beautiful lingerie and a fat rubber band of credit cards. I popped the MasterCard in my back pocket next to the quail. It's more as a memento and disappeared into the bathroom opening the cupboard. Saw a large bottle of 10 milligram Valium, which I immediately pocketed and felt much better. Thought I'd make the rounds one more time before departure. Opened the door to find Marty cleaning his fingernails with a small switchblade. Axel Greasy mumbled, and I could smell it on him. Kind of smelled like gasoline. Kind of turned me on. Kind of reminded me of my first 
real fuck with some blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid in upstate New York whose father was a two-bit mechanic. Uh, I'll be right back, he mumbled, undoing his belt buckle, which, if I remember correctly, was a tarnished Grim Reaper. I disappeared out to the balcony, figuring he'd come looking. I scanned the L.A. skyline. It was a neon blur of late-night calm where scattered numbers started going off in my head as I tried to size up the population, wondering at that very moment how many dollars were being spent in the vulgar pursuit of the next big thing, next major motion picture, big star, scheme, scam, rip-off, rape. I started wondering how many living rooms were under siege by drunken day laborers taking out the boss's bullshit on the wife and kids. I started wondering how many guns were going off in the back of dirty alleys behind scuzzy bars. How many Mexican gangbangers were taking a bullet in the left temple. How many kids at that very moment were undergoing their first real hustle with some stinking John and any make a car cruising down Hollywood Boulevard, Crenshaw Boulevard, Santa Monica Boulevard didn't hear him come out, but I felt him on the back of my neck. Creepy crawl, he whispered. It was an invitation I knew I had to, someday, somehow, take him up on. I mean, Marty was hot. He was a mongrel mix of Cherokee Indian and Black Irish trouble, in other words. And he spoke in this strange dialect, which was way more the film Deliverance or Southern Comfort or the Blue Ridge Mountains than it was Southern California. I mean, Pleasant had filled me in. She told me he'd spent his formative years racing dirt bikes in the backyard of the Manson family down in the snake pit of Topanga Canyon, that he loved to watch the mudslides come and go, wiping out the hippies and hillbillies and dirt farmers who'd set up camp in ill-constructed shacks near enough to the valley to still be light years away. Marty said he stayed there because he respected Mother Nature's mean street. And besides, what's a little mud? The shack that he lived in with his brother, a lowbrow surf freak, had already withstood four feet of thick sludge seeping in and back out its four shit-stained walls. Oh, he said he'd move, eventually. I have to admit, I kind of dug his gumption, his devil-may-care attitude. I invited him back to my hotel the next night, told him to stop by when he was through restyling the hair of would-be B actresses that frequented the upscale yet still gritty salon he managed a few blocks from the beach a few days a week. I prepared for our date by swallowing a few of those stolen quaaludes and washing it down with my good friend Jack Daniels. I slipped into sheer black, applied some lipstick, my finest pumps, dimmed the light, opened the door, a hairline fracture crack, popped the matchbook flap into the deadbolt with true confession stamped seductively and fire engine read its 900 number torn in two. And then I waited, stimulating myself with moistened fingertips dipped in drink, the skin almost singing, stinging as it contracted as I pulled and twisted myself between thumb and forefinger. It felt so fucking good, I must have just passed out. Woke up to find scissors pressed firmly to throat. The smell of Hair gel and axle grease, a pungent intoxicant, the mute TV transmitting a dead station whose black and white shadows tangoed upon the bed. Will you die for me? He mumbled. Quoting Manson's head trip played on Tex Watson a few days before the Tate LaBianca murders. Oh, baby, 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 I'd... I'd fucking kill for you, I lied, cementing a bond that would become a two-year-long on-again, off-again, love-hate, white trash romance. Now, the sex must have been good, because it's a fucking blur.